Hi coders, JC here. Welcome to my game engine series. Today we're talking about scene loading and the scene graph in our engine. This is the first of four videos about game engine basics. In this mini series, we will discuss fundamental engine functions. We recommend adding those before diving into advanced topics. Okay, so you just finished the Vulkan introduction tutorials. Now you probably have big plans about rendering techniques, or let's say terrain generation, or maybe writing a level editor. The following videos will take a look at the foundation of the engine. This is to make your life easier when you work on your own computer graphics project. For example, scene loading is not only essential for any game, it also helps with testing and troubleshooting, especially if you want to break down rendering problems you can quickly simplify scenes to isolate issues. It also helps with regression testing. I usually keep scenes around in my engine for testing individual features. I have a scene for shadows, one for skeletal animation, one for instancing, and so on. Now, when I work on new topics, I can make sure I didn't break anything. So in this video here, we look into scene loading and the tree hierarchy of the models in a scene. In the second video, we'll discuss 3D model loading with GLTF and FBX. Then in the third video of this mini-series, we have instancing and the material system. And last but not least, there'll be a video about threat pools in KTX. You can tell the topics of this mini-series are all revolving around getting 3D models efficiently on the screen. We'll show how to organize them, including the required resources. If you haven't done texture loading before, do check out the video on my channel about texture loading. We'll be loading lots of textures in this mini-series. Optionally, you could take a look at creating a skybox with a Vulcan cube map. It's quite similar to texture loading, and a skybox improves the appearance of your scenes a lot. A quick shout out to Mantar, who provided animations for this video. Thank you for that, Mantar. This brings us to the first topic on our list today. To describe a scene, you can choose from a range of file formats. YAML, XML or JSON come to mind. Originally, I started off with YAML and I was actually quite happy with it. And now I switched over to JSON. You can find the code for both loaders in my engine. The YAML scene description format was pretty much just the file names for models and a corresponding transform. Then I could also nest YAML files to share prefabs among multiple scenes. The JSON format I'm using now has more features, such as instancing and parameters for individual nodes. Inspired by the format of GLTF files, I switched over to JSON because I like how it's a bit more explicit than YAML. For example, I prefer how it defines scopes. Just for simplicity, I created this little island scene here. It has four GLTF files and one FBX file. You can see scene loading is a really easy way to compose an environment. The majority of models in this island scene come directly from Blender. Now all my engine has to do is to render them and animate them. Of course, the engine can be used to arrange the layout and save it. But my idea is not to replicate functions from Blender. This is how the JSON format looks like. There's a header at the top with general information. Then it has a section for GLTF files and one for FBX files. Each file has one or multiple instances, whereby each instance has a transform. Individual nodes can have attributes, such as here, for the main character animation, the walk speed. This format here is just what I use. Now you have to tailor it to your needs. For example, if you're working on terrain generation, you put here all the parameters your different scenarios require. When it comes to lights and cameras, keep in mind GLTF also supports those. So I wouldn't add them here and instead get them directly from a Blender export. Let me show you some tools that I used to design the JSON format. 
for one, there is Mock Turtle. Here you can create a graph of all objects you need. You can choose from the data types that JSON provides. Mock Turtle then outputs a template JSON file with all fields and random data. You can edit this template and change it into an actual scene description. Another tool that I found helpful is this here, JSON Formatter. It pretty prints the file and it can be used as a syntax checker. To read the JSON files, I chose a library called simdjson. You can find it on GitHub and add it to your project as a submodule. As a note, this library cannot serialize to disk. It can read JSON, but it doesn't write it. This is no big deal, as generating JSON is rather simple, and most of the work is to retrieve the data from the scene abstraction. That is something you have to do no matter what. Anyways, simply JSON is fast and it works well for me. Now let's take a look at the C++ code. The way SIMD JSON works is that it provides a continuous data stream. It doesn't like to rewind, so you shouldn't search for fields in the JSON file. Instead, let it discover objects for you and process them as they come. Here, it's reading the top level fields that we looked at just a moment ago in Mock Turtle. The code simply iterates over all top level elements and sorts them away as they come in. This way, the order of how the JSON file is providing objects doesn't matter. For certain objects, you should set default values. For example, the transform should be initialized with sensible defaults for scale, rotation, and translation. Then you let SimbyJSON do its thing, and independently of the order of the individual fields of the transform, you can override those defaults. This way, it also doesn't matter if a field of the transform is missing from the JSON file. Then for each level of the JSON file, you either call a subfunction, if a JSON array or JSON struct was found, or if you hit a leave of this nested hierarchy, meaning you found an actual value, you can store it directly if it's just a parameter or you call a function to process it. For example, when you found a file name, you would call the corresponding GLTF or FBX loader. To serialize a scene, I created a set of functions to write JSON objects, such as a number, a string, or a boolean. For every object that I use in my scene description format, I created such a function. You can see here, for example, the GLTF files field and here the GLTF file name field. Each function has an indention level and an optional parameter to append a comma. Then I iterate over the engine internal scene structure to retrieve all data to be serialized. For each GLTF file, the scene structure has a top level game ID which can be used to retrieve the transform. This here is the code to query the entity component system to retrieve the scale, rotation and translation. This way, changes to the scene can be captured. Here you can see the function to serialize a node and down here it repeats for FBX files. And that's it for scene loading. This brings us to topic number two, the scene graph. The scene graph is a tree hierarchy comprised of nodes. Each model in a scene is represented in the scene graph by such a node. There can also be other nodes, such as group nodes, serving as containers. Each model and each group node in a scene have a transform for scale, rotation and translation. Well, actually, they have two transforms, a local transform and a global transform. The local transform can be edited for example with the I'm GUI debug editor, or it can be animated by the application, which means the application manipulates the local transform procedurally. For static objects that just sit there, the local transform normally comes directly from a GLTF or FBX file. Even when a mesh is generated procedurally, the application still needs to assign a local transform once. Usually, when we talk about the transform of a model, we refer to its local transform. And then there is a global transform. The global transform for a model, or generally for 
any node in the scene graph is the combination of the global parent transform and the local transform. The global transform equals the global parent transform times the local transform. This is a recursive definition that needs to be applied to a current node and then recursively to all child nodes. Since the root node in a scene doesn't have a parent, for the root node this formula can be simplified to global transform equals local transform. To compute the global transform of a node, the global transform of the parent must be up to date. For this, we start updating the transform cache at the root of the scene graph. And once we updated a global transform for a current node, we can iterate over its children and pass the current global transform to the children as a global parent transform. So the global transform is dynamically calculated each frame. The actual matrix multiplication global parent transform times local transform of course only happens when any local transform changed, be it the local transform directly from the current model or any parent local transform. The global transform is then used in the vertex shader to place the model into the scene. In Blender, you can parent nodes to other nodes. You can parent one mesh to another mesh, or you can place so-called empty nodes. This is what I refer to as group nodes. Changes to the transform of any node trickle down to its child nodes. GLTF and FBX files support this per model tree hierarchy and we can load it into our engine. In general, when a model is loaded into my engine, it assigns a group node to this hierarchy with a transform as per the JSON scene description. Now let's take a look at the code. The scene graph can be found in the scene folder of the engine. In the header, we have the actual scene class down here, and then up here, you can see a class for tree nodes. The scene graph is based on a vector of those tree nodes, and then there is a map to retrieve nodes from the scene graph by means of a game object. Then a tree node has a game object ID, a short and a long name, a vector of child nodes to index into the nodes vector of the scene graph. Here, the scene graph can create a new node, and here, a tree node can add a child. Then in the renderer, in the Vulkan folder under platform, the update transform cache function is called in the submit function. As arguments to the update transform cache function, the current scene is provided, as node the root node, as parent transform an identity matrix, and the dirty flag input is set to false. The function then retrieves the current node, its game object ID, the transform of that game object, and the dirty flag of that transform. The dirty flag is then or combined with the dirty flag from the argument. This is used to pass any changes of the local transform down to the child nodes. If the dirty flag is set, the function updates the global transform of the current node by passing the parent global transform. Then it retrieves the just updated global transform and calls itself for all child nodes by passing down the global transform as a parent global transform and the dirty flag. Here we have another point of interest, the transform component. It can be found in components.h in the scene folder of the engine. It holds the local transform and its subcomponents scale, rotation and translation. All right access to the local transform is guarded by a dirty flag. Just on a side note, the transform component also manages access to the global transform. However, the global transform is actually stored in an instance buffer that can be shared among multiple game objects. But we will get to this in the video about instancing I announced earlier. Back to the dirty flag, if we search for it in components.cpp, you can see how it's set and reset. Here we set it. And in the member function recalculate matrices, it is reset. This function is called 
by set map for global that we just saw a minute ago in the renderer. So this is how the scene graph works, how it's updated and how the transform cache works. The last thing that I wanted to discuss today is the algorithm for copying the node hierarchy of a GLTF or FBX file into the scene graph. The little challenge here is to strip off unwanted nodes. By that, I mainly mean the nodes of the bones of a skeletal animation. A node should only be copied into the scene graph if itself or any child serve an actual purpose in the scene graph. If a node has a mesh, then yes, we want it to be in the scene graph. If the node is a camera, then, well, I leave this up to you. If the node is a light, then probably yes, we do want to edit the position of a light. But if it's a bone from a skeletal animation, then no, it's just clogging up the scene graph. I implemented this function to copy a node hierarchy from a GLTF or FBX file into the scene graph with a two-pass approach. So I traversed the source tree once to determine if a node shall be brought over into the scene graph or not. This pass starts at the root and traverses all the way down to the leaves. Then on its way up, it starts to flag nodes to be copied once something worthy was found. So the order nodes are discovered is child first, parent next. In this order, we cannot insert elements into the scene graph. It always has to be parent first, then insert child nodes. That's why I run a second pass that also starts at the root and copies the now flagged nodes over into the scene graph. And that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, feedback or topic requests. Please like this video and if you can, also like my engine on GitHub and consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you and bye bye.